So I wanted to ask you a question. I've been thinking a lot lately about, about what power is. Um, and I was thinking about what power do we as humans actually have? And you can think of a lot of things like, you know, financial power or power at your job or power with your, over your children. Um, and sometimes in, in a small way, we even have power when we wake up in the morning because we can decide what we're going to do today. You know, that, that's power. But when you're talking about spiritual power, what power do we actually have? What power do I have to control or manipulate the spiritual world? Have you ever thought about that? You know, I think we, we might list, we might make a list of, well, we could, you know, we could raise the dead and we can, we can, you know, heal the sick and, you know, we can call down angels from heaven and all these kind of things. But can we really do that on a cue? Can we really just decide, okay, now angels, come on down, or, you know, you are healed, or, you know, can we really do that? Do we have that power? And I think it's obvious that the answer is no. We, we don't. We can't. Because we are not the ones that do it, right? The Lord God in heaven does these things. And so the only power that I have is to repent. That is my only power, to make a choice to repent and uh, leave the world behind and follow Jesus. And then his power can illuminate me and affect the spiritual world. But I think we forget that we've got to have that element of repentance. I think we oftentimes we think to ourselves, you know, I mean, we go into situations assuming things. Well, I'm in the priesthood, or I, you know, I have this great knowledge, or I, you know, I've studied all those things. I've written a book. You know, all these things that we, we, we sort of prop ourselves up with. But at the end of the day, if I haven't repented of my sins, then it means nothing. All this other stuff that I've done in my life, that I've learned in my life, that I've accomplished in my life, it's all nothing if I don't repent and come unto him. And that is the central theme of the Book of Mormon. That he wants his people, his covenant people, to repent and come unto him. And that's why we're told to preach nothing but repentance. Because that's the only thing that has power. So Nephi, as he was communicating with the, with the angel at the very beginning, you know, when they were still in the old world, um, and I've, I've passed out, I've given you all a sheet, so um, I think the scriptures that I'm reading are all on there. Um, so feel free to make notes or whatever you want on that, on that paper, it's for you. But reading out of 1 Nephi 3, it says, And it came to pass that I, Nephi, was desirous that also I might see and hear and know of these things. So his father had this great experience. Now Nephi, he wants to have this experience. So he says, and it says, that I might know these things by the power of the Holy Ghost, which is the gift of God unto all those who diligently seek him, as well as in times of old, as in times that he should, as in the time that he should manifest himself unto the children of men. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the way is prepared for all men from the foundation of the world. Notice it says all men, and it's talking about men and women, all, all of humans not just certain tribes or certain you know, races or whatever. It's all of God's creation, all of the human beings he's created. That all men from the foundation of the world, if, such a tiny little word, two-letter word, if, is what this whole thing pivots on. If it so be that they repent and come unto me. And so all these things that God has done, they all pivot on that one word of repentance. And so, if you continue on, Nephi has continued to learn more about God and his plan. And, and I'll skip down to 2 Nephi 1. It says, And after that Adam and Eve had partaken of the forbidden fruit, they were driven out from the Garden of Eden to till the earth. And they have brought forth children, yea, even the family of all the earth. And the days of the children of men were prolonged according to the will of God, that they might repent while in, while in the flesh. Therefore their state became a state of probation, and their time was lengthened 
according to the commandments which the Lord God gave unto the children of men. For he gave commandment that all men must repent. So he's made a way possible. He's given us this probationary period, and he gave us a commandment that we repent. Because if we don't, all these things that we've done in our lives, all these things that we've learned, all these things we've accomplished, won't work. They won't help. They won't matter. They'll be lost. And so we see that it is a requirement that we must repent. So skipping down into, into Helaman. So Helaman is teaching his, the, his young men um, about the gospel. And this is out of Helaman 2. It says, And remember also the words which Amulek spake unto Zeezrom in the city of Ammoniah. For he said unto them that, they sh- that the Lord should surely come to redeem his people, but that he should not come to redeem them in their sins, but to redeem them from their sins. In other words, they have to want it. They have to repent in order for him to redeem them. And he hath power given unto him from the Father to redeem them from their sins because of repentance. Therefore he hath sent his angels to declare the tidings of the conditions of repentance, which bringeth unto the power of the Redeemer unto the salvation of their souls. And then reading the next one there, in um, Second Nephi, it said, and this is this is talking to the Gentiles. It says, "Woe be unto the Gentiles," saith the Lord God of hosts, "for notwithstanding, I shall lengthen out my arm." What's that mean? Do you remember to lengthen out your arm from class? What is it when God lengthens out His arm? What does that mean? Mercy. He's giving His mercy. Um, for notwithstanding, I shall lengthen out my arm unto them from day to day they will deny me, talking about the Gentiles here. Nevertheless, I will be merciful unto them, saith the Lord God, if they will repent. Again, that big two-letter word, if they will repent and come unto me, for my arm is lengthened out all the day long, saith the Lord God of hosts. Now, I know that I'm not telling you anything you haven't heard before. We all know that we need to repent of sin. It's not new. But I think what has happened over time is that, and not just over time, but in our own individual lives, it's happened in my life, where you get used to a sin. You get used to doing a sin until the point where it just becomes normalized, where it's just what we do. Um, and that's what's happening in our world. You know, all these things that we're seeing, the, you know, the sexual sins and all these things we're seeing, they're normalizing it. We're getting it, we're getting bombarded on the TV and the internet and movies and all that to get us to just normalize it and accept it and it's just the way it is. We're not even calling it sin anymore. You know, for a while it was, for many, for generations it was sin. Then it became, you know, um, a lifestyle choice and then it became, you know, a mental illness. And then, you know, I mean, it's like we, and now it's just normal. Now it's, these things are just normal. You know, these, these sins that, that we are accepting in our society. And I don't think we're just doing it with our society. I think that we do it with ourselves, too. There's things in our lives that we know that we should do differently, that there's people we need to forgive. There's things that we need to eliminate out of our lives. There's things we need to start doing with our time. But we normalize not doing those things, and so we accept it. And we still feel good. Our conscience isn't beating us up over it because we've normalized it. And the thing about God is that He doesn't force Himself on us. You know, He doesn't come and put it right in your face and say, you need to stop doing this. He whispers with a still small voice, and we can choose to ignore it. And then the next day, He'll do it again, and we choose to ignore it. And eventually, He'll just leave us alone. He'll, he'll step back. And then we'll have to go through a trial, something to wake us up, some, you know, a divorce or a loss of, you know, of life or, or health or, you know, my daughter's house burned down. I and mean, we... You know, this has been a devastating thing for her, losing a baby and her house burning down all in the same week. But I know that God loves her more than anybody else on this planet could love her. And I know this is going to work for her good. You know, I don't understand how. I don't know in what way. I don't know what his plan is. But I trust him that it's going to work out. She's going to look back and be thankful for what happened because it's going to build character in her. I can look back on, like, my divorce that I had, that I suffered you know, it was terrible. It was horrible. I was near, near to the point of suicide. 
You know, this was 20 years ago. But I, I'm thankful for it. God worked, was working in me. It was the refiner's fire that he was putting me through for me to grow. And it took me to the next level of, of my maturity, my spiritual maturity. And so, but what he really, what, but what matters more than anything else is that when we come through these trials, that we come out of them and we repent. If we come out of them as a victim of the trial, then we stay right where we were before, and now we're carrying the, bit, the baggage of more stress and more problems and, you know, woe is me. We've got to come out of them realizing God's trying to get my attention or God's, God put this in my way for me to learn this lesson that I'm learning. And so we can truly rejoice. Like it says in the Bible, count it all joy when you fall into many afflictions. So as I was preparing for this sermon, I, I had some scriptures lined up and it was interesting because I, as I started lining them all up, I started looking at the references and realized about half of my scriptures were all out of the same chapter of the Book of Mormon. So I, I decided to just read the whole chapter, and I, have, I normally wouldn't do this in a sermon, but there's just so much here that I feel like I need to just go through this chapter with you. And so the printout has it, and I know it's a lot of reading, and we'll, we'll, take some, we'll stop in the middle and we'll talk a little bit, but I... There's so much here. This is so profound. It's, it's a prophecy from Nephi about our day, about the future. And it also talks about, so it's talking about the house of Israel, it's talking about the gathering, and it's also talking about what needs to happen in our lives. And I think it's really important that we understand it. And I don't want to paraphrase it and take away from what the scriptures actually say. So that next big, long scripture there in your, in your handout, um, is, uh, it's out of... Um, 2 Nephi 12. So I'm going to start reading. It says, And now behold, my brethren, I have spoken unto you according as the Spirit has, hath constrained me, wherefore I know that they must surely come to pass. So he's been talking to his brothers. He's been sharing the, the future and what to expect and that they need to repent. And it says, And the things which shall be written out of the book, now it's talking about out of the Book of Mormon that's going to come forward to his seed, future seed, the, thing, the things which shall be written out of the book shall be of great worth unto the children of men, and especially unto our seed, which are the remnant of the house of Israel. For it shall come to pass in that day that the churches which are built up and not unto the Lord, when one shall say unto another, Behold, I am the Lord's, and the other shall say, I am the Lord's. You think about how many churches there are in this world. How many religions? And then within those religions, how many separate churches, all with their own little flavor, and they all think they're right, you know? And so it says that, that it prophesied that this would happen. All these churches would be built up, and they would not be built up to the Lord. And it says, When one shall say unto the other, Behold, I, I am the Lord's, and the other shall say, I, I am the Lord's. And thus shall everyone say that hath built up churches, and not unto the Lord. And they shall contend one with another. And their priests... Should, now remember, this was written in 600 B.C. So this is a long time ago, but it's proven very true. And their priests shall contend one with another, and they shall teach with their learning and deny the Holy Ghost, which giveth utterance. And so it is, it is lazy and easy to teach with learning, especially today with the Internet. Because we can just find all the information that we want, we can copy and paste it into something, and we can throw it out there. You know, it is so easy to teach with, with learning. But it is not easy to teach with the Holy Ghost, because in order to have the gift of the Holy Ghost, you have to repent of sin. And so if you have not repented of your sin, then you don't have the Holy Ghost inside of you, and you're, you're forced to teach from learning, from what you've read, instead of what God has revealed. It says, And they deny the power of God, the Holy One of Israel. And they say unto the people, Hearken unto us, and hear ye our precept. For behold, there is no God today. For the Lord and the Redeemer hath done His work, and he hath, and he hath given His power unto men. Men stand in His stead. Now that's not true. That's a lie. We don't stand in His place. No one stands in the place of God. Behold, hearken ye unto my precept, if they shall say there is a miracle wrought by the hand of the Lord, believe it not. 
For this day he is not a God of miracles. He hath done his work. Yea, and there shall be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and it shall be well with us. There's a lot of religions out there that believe that, that we all you have to do is, is pray to God and repent of your sins one time, and you're good to go. Enjoy your life. God made all these yummy foods and everything for you to go out there and just enjoy it, and don't worry about it. He's got it. You know, and that is a lie. That is a deception. It says, And there shall also be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry, Nevertheless, fear God. He will justify in committing a little sin, yea, a little, yea, lie a little. Take the advantage of one because of his words. Dig a pit for thy neighbor. There is no harm in doing these things. And do all these things for tomorrow we die. Life is short, right? So we should go out there and live to the fullest. And if it so be that we are guilty, God will beat us with a few stripes. And at last we shall be saved in the kingdom of God. So in the end, because God's so great, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Just do what you want. He's he's got your back. It says, Yea, and there shall be many which shall teach after this manner uh, false and vain and foolish doctrines, and shall be puffed up in their hearts, and shall seek deep to hide their counsels from the Lord, and their works shall be in the dark, and the blood of the saints shall cry from the ground against them, we talked about that in class today, the secret combinations of religions that are doing things behind the scenes, secret organizations, secret things from within. Um, ironic where we are today <laughs> as far as a secret organization. Um, and it says, uh, uh, Yea, they have all gone out of the way. They have become corrupted. And they've become corrupted because of pride and because of the false teachers and false doctrines Their churches have become corrupted, and their churches are lifted up because of pride. They are puffed up. They rob the poor because of their fine sanctuaries. And I'm just, when I think of the fine sanctuaries, I'm reminded of of these churches that are just unbelievable. You know, these churches that are, you know, the size of a football stadium almost, you know, that are just, their churches, they're supposed to be a place where we come and we humbly worship God, and we, you know, we fellowship with one another, and it's turned into, you know, a big entertainment venue with, you know, live music and coffee bar and, you know, it's, it's this, this, they have big concerts and, you know, and it's all taking the money of the people, making the people feel responsible to give all this money and build these, um, you know, like I think about like the, all the LDS temples, you know, these are elaborate, expensive buildings, millions and millions and millions of dollars spent on these buildings. And yet they have many poor that feel feel obligated to give 10% of, of their money to the church because that's the doctrine. And uh, they're violating the Book of Mormon at, right as they do that. It says, They rob the poor because of their fine clothing, and they persecute the meek and the poor in heart because in their pride they are puffed up. They wear stiff necks and high heads. Yea, and because of pride and wickedness and abominations and whoredoms, they have all gone astray. Save it be a few which are the humble followers of Christ. Nevertheless, they are led, that in many instances they do err, because they are taught by the precepts of men. O oh, the wise and the learned and the rich that are puffed up in the pride of their hearts, and all they that preach false doctrines, and all they that commit whoredoms and pervert the right way of the Lord. Woe, woe, woe. When you get three woes in a row in the scriptures, that's really, really, really bad. Woe, woe, woe be unto them, saith the Lord God Almighty, for they shall be thrust down to hell. Woe unto them that turn aside the just for a thing of naught, and revile against that which is good, and say that it is of no worth. I think of today in our, in our politics, you know, where you've got people that are, you know, honest, good people that are being taken down because of political agendas, you know, that have their, their lies are being told about them. You know, and on the flip side, you've got evil people that are having their videos edited and replayed to make it sound like they said something different, that what they said was more eloquent. You know, and we, we, as, we just trust them because it's on TV and we watch it happen even though it got edited and we didn't know it. You know? these, are the, these are the evil combinations of men in the last days that scriptures prophesy of. So starting in verse 20, For the day shall come that the Lord God will speedily visit the inhabitants of the earth, And in that day, that they are fully ripe in iniquity, they shall perish. 
And we've seen this right here in our own, on our own land multiple times. The Jaredites got completely ripened in iniquity up to the point where they were almost all gone. They all killed each other off. And God swept them off and brought in the, the Nephites and raised them up until they were wicked to the point where he, swiped, he swept, used the Lamanites to swipe them off or wipe them off. And then the Lamanites got wiped out by us when we came here, got scattered by, you know, by the settlers, by the, by the um, you know, first the, the French and the Spanish and, you know, then the, then the English. And so we've seen that on this land that we're living on right now. That's the promise of this land is that if you're not righteous, you will be swept off. And God allows you to be in your sin for a while until you're ripened in iniquity. And then once you're fully ripened in iniquity, you're wiped off and the Lord brings in another group of people because we, this land is a promised land. And so it says, um, <clears throat> For the day shall come that the Lord God will speedily visit the inhabitants of the earth, and in that day that they are fully ripe in iniquity, they shall perish. But behold, if the inhabitants of the earth shall repent of their wickedness and abominations, they shall not be destroyed, saith the Lord of hosts. But behold, that great and abominable church, the whore of all the earth, must tumble to the earth, and great must be the fall thereof. For the kingdom of the devil must... Now remember, we're talking about there's two churches on the earth. The church of the devil, the abominable church, and the church of the Lamb of God, or the humble followers of Christ. That's all there is. And we've divided it off into all these denominations, and we've given it all these names, and created all these structures and organizations and all that. But when it comes right down to it, the Book of Mormon clearly states there's just two churches. Those that follow Jesus and those that don't. Um, and so when this abominable church becomes ripened in its iniquity, uh, it, will be, it will be judged. It says, uh, But behold, if the inhabitants of the earth shall repent of their wickedness and abominations, they shall not be destroyed, saith the Lord of hosts. But behold, that great and abominable church, the whore of all the earth, must tumble to the earth, and great must be the fall thereof. For the kingdom of the devil must shake, and they which belong to it must needs be stirred up unto repentance. Again, we're back to that, that base core foundation. You know, I used to play basketball in high school. And whenever we did, like whenever we went and played a, a, a team and we did horrible, you know, we didn't run our plays right and, you know, we were, you know, we missed shots and we were just doing terrible. The next practice, the coach would, was relentless, you know. I mean, we were going to suffer for what we did. But he always, he always beat, beat in our heads back to the fundamentals, back to the fundamentals. We'd be running laps and working out and, you know, doing these, I forget what we called them, but we'd go up and run to the, you know, we'd go back and forth on the court all the way to up and down. You know, I think they were called suicides. But anyway, we just, it was terrible. It was really painful to do. And, you know, and we'd be working on shots. We'd be working, you know, like pass the ball and turn and do shoots. Just real basic, you know, like 101, basketball 101 stuff. We weren't doing elaborate plays. We weren't scrimmaging. We were back to just doing the basics and um, the fundamentals. And that's what God is trying to do right here. What he's talking about is that great and abominable church is going to be tear, torn down. The, 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 those in the world that reject Jesus are going, to be, are going to be going to pay for it. They're going to be kept out of his kingdom. But then he says, um, he says, For the kingdom of the devil must shake, and they which belong to it must needs be stirred up to repentance. That's the baseline. That's the fundamentals. That's the running suicides in the gym. The back to the basics, repentance. Or the devil will grasp them with his everlasting chains, and they be stirred up to anger and perish. For behold, at that day, at that day shall he rage in the hearts of the children of men, and stir them up to anger against that which is good. Think about what we've seen in the news. Think about what they're doing to people that, that, want to, that do not want to get an abortion. You know, or think about what's happening politically. I mean, you talk about anger and rage against those that just want to serve God. You know, I think about the, the kicker for the chiefs, you know, that, that gave that speech at, at a college, you know, and basically just told the, told the ladies, he said, it's, if, you want to be a, if you want to be a housewife and a mother, that's an honorable thing. And it's something to be proud of. And this is at a Christian college. So, I mean, you'd expect them to, you know, talk about God. And, there, of course, it, he was, he's famous, so I made it to the news, and then, you know, the, the media just ran with it and just, just raked him over the coals, just, how dare you, and 
turn, to turn all these women into wallflowers or whatever. And, and he was just telling them that being a mother is a wonderful thing. You know, something beautiful that God created, but he got turned into this horrible, sexist monster of a man, you know, by the media. Calling that which is good evil, and that which is evil good. And it says, uh, and others he will pacify and lull them away into carnal security. And this is where I think that we really run the risk of this. Where things are calm, things are quiet, we have our retirement fund, we have church, we have, you know, there's no one here trying to burn the building down or, or shoot us or anything else. We're here worshiping, we're here, you know, living our lives, we're taking our little vacations, we're, you know, nobody here is wondering if you're going to get to eat later on today. Nobody's wondering if we're going to have a home to go to tonight or a bed to sleep in. You know, this is where we need to be on our guard. <clears throat> it says, And others he will pacify and lull them away into carnal security, that they will say, All is well in Zion. Yea, Zion prospereth, all is well. And thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them away carefully down to hell. And the reason they're being lulled to sleep is because they're not repenting. We have to be repenting every day, spending time with God every single day. Because if we're not, then we're getting a little to sleep, and we fit into this category of those that are saying, all is well in Zion. You know, I've, I've, made, I've been baptized. I go to church. I pay my taxes. I'm, I'm good. Now I'm just waiting on Christ to come. That is not what God wants us to do. He wants us to have a relationship with him. And it says, And thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them away carefully down to hell. And behold, others he flattereth away and tell them there is no hell. And he saith unto them, I am no devil, for there is none. And thus he whispereth in their ears until he grasps them with his awful chains from whence there is no deliverance. Yea, they are grasped with death and hell. And death and hell and the devil and all that have been seized therewith must stand before the throne of God and be judged according to their works. Can you imagine what it's going to be like for Satan to have to go before God to be judged? That is not going to be a comfortable conversation. And can you imagine if you have to stand there next to him, having chosen to live his life rather than repenting? That's going to be weeping and wailing, gnashing of teeth. From whence they must go into the place prepared for them, even a lake of fire and brimstone, which is endless torment. Therefore, woe be unto him that is at ease in Zion. Woe be unto him that crieth, all is well. Yea, woe be unto him that hearkeneth unto the precepts of men, and denieth the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost. The power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost are made manifest in your life because of repentance. If we don't repent, then the power of the Holy Ghost is not going to be made manifest in your life as a fruit. Yea, woe unto him that saith, We have received and we need no more. And in fine woe unto all they that tremble and are angry because of the truth of God. For behold, he that is built upon the rock receiveth it with gladness. And he that is built upon a sandy foundation trembleth lest he shall fall. Woe be unto him that shall say, we have received the word of God, and we need no more of the word of God, for we have enough. For behold, thus saith the Lord God, I will give unto the children of men line upon line, and precept upon precept, here a little, and there a little. And blessed are they that hearken unto my precepts, and lend an ear unto my counsel, for they shall learn wisdom. You know, I think it's a good exercise once in a while to look at your life, look back five years ago. Where were you five years ago, spiritually speaking? What was your prayer life like? What was your, what was your study life like? How was your fasting? How were you treating other people? How was your relationships? How were things at your job? Think about where you were five years ago, and then look at where you are today. Hopefully, there's progress, because it says there that God, He does it he, he will give unto the children of men line upon line, precept upon precept. So we should be in a constant state of growing, of, of improving, drawing near to him. It says, For unto him that receiveth I will give more, and them that shall say, We have enough, 
from them shall be taken away even that which they have. Cursed is he that putteth his trust in man, or maketh flesh his arm, or shall hearken unto the precepts of men, save their precepts shall be given by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now here it starts talking to the Gentiles again. Woe be unto the Gentiles, saith the Lord God of hosts. For notwithstanding, I shall lengthen out my arm unto them from day to day. They will deny me. Nevertheless, I will be merciful unto them, saith the Lord God, if they will repent and come unto me, for mine arm is lengthened out all the day long, saith the Lord God of hosts. But behold, there shall be many at that day when I shall proceed to do a marvelous work among them, that I may remember. So this is the marvelous work. When the Book of Mormon was brought forth and God began to reclaim Israel, that was the beginning of that process of Him reclaiming His his people. That I may remember my covenants which I have made unto the children of men, that I may set my hand again the second time to recover my people which are of the house of Israel, and also that I may remember the promises which I made unto thee, Nephi, and also unto thy father that I would remember your seed, and that the words of your seed should proceed forth out of my mouth unto your seed. And my words shall hiss forth unto the ends of the earth for a standard unto my people, which are of the house of Israel. And because my words shall hiss forth, many Gentiles shall say, A Bible, a Bible, we have got a Bible, and there cannot be any more Bible. But thus saith the Lord God, O fools, they shall have a Bible, and it shall proceed forth from the Jews." mine ancient covenant people. And what think they the Jews for the Bible which they receive from them? Yea, what do the Gentiles mean? Do they remember the travails and labors and pains of the Jews and their diligence unto me in bringing forth salvation unto the Gentiles? O ye Gentiles, have ye remembered the Jews, mine ancient covenant people? Nay, but ye have cursed them and have hated them and have not sought to recover them. But behold, I will return all these things upon your own heads, for I, the Lord, hath not forgotten my people. Thou fool that shall say, A Bible, we have got a Bible, and we need no more Bible. Have ye obtained a Bible, save it were by the Jews? Know ye not that there are more nations, there are more nations than one? Know ye not that I, the Lord your God, have created all men? And that I remember that they which are upon the isles of the sea, and that I rule in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. And I will bring forth my word unto the children of men, yea, even unto all, upon all the nations of the earth. Wherefore murmur ye, because ye shall receive more of my word? Know ye not that the testimony of two nations is a witness unto you that I am God? That I remember one nation like unto another? Wherefore I speak the same words unto one nation, like unto another. And when the two nations shall run together, the testimony of the two nations shall run together also. And I do this that I may prove unto many that I am the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that I speak forth my words according to mine own pleasure. And because that I have spoken one word, ye need not suppose that I cannot speak another, for my work is not yet finished. Neither shall it be until the end of man neither from that time henceforth and forever. Wherefore, because that ye have a Bible, ye need not suppose that it contains all my words. Neither need ye suppose that I have not caused more to be written. For I command all men, both in the east and in the west and in the north and in the south and in the isles of the sea, that they shall write the words which I shall speak unto them, which I speak unto them. For out of the books which shall be written, I will judge the world, every man according to their works, according to that which is written. For behold, I shall speak unto the Jews, and they shall write it. And I shall also speak unto the Nephites, and they shall write it. Now we have those two books, right? Book of Mormon, the Bible. There's more. There's more coming. And I shall also speak unto the other tribes of the house of Israel, which I have led away and they shall write it. And I shall speak also unto the nations of the earth, and they shall write it. And it shall come to pass that the Jews shall have the words of the Nephites, and the Nephites shall have the words of the Jews. And the Nephites and the Jews 
shall have the words of the lost tribes of Israel. So there's more coming. There's more for us to look forward to. And the host and the lost tribes of Israel shall have the words of the Nephites and the Jews. And it shall come to pass that my people, which are of the house of Israel, shall be gathered home unto the lands of their possessions, and my word also shall be gathered in one. This is the gathering. When God gathers his chosen Israel, when they repent and come unto him, when he gathers them back to their homelands. And I will show unto them that fight against my word and against my people, which are of the house of Israel, that I am God, and that I covenanted with Abraham, that I would remember his seed forever. And now, behold, my beloved brethren, I would speak unto you, for I, Nephi, would not suffer that ye should suppose that ye are more righteous than the Gentiles shall be. So he's telling them, you know, don't assume. I'm telling you that the Gentiles are going to fall. They're going to make a lot of mistakes and they're going to fail. But don't think that you're going to be more righteous than them. So he says, For I, Nephi, would not suffer that ye should suppose that ye are more righteous than the Nephites shall be, or than the Gentiles shall be. For behold, except ye shall keep the commandments of God, ye shall all likewise perish. And because of the words which have been spoken, ye need not suppose that the Gentiles are utterly destroyed. In other words, there will be Gentile individuals that survive. But as a nation, we're going to fall. But it's, un- it's up to us to do the magic word, repent. And once we do that, we become adopted in to the house of Israel. So it says, For behold, I say unto you, as many of the Gentiles as will repent are the covenant people of the Lord. And as many of the Jews as will not repent shall be cast off. For the Lord covenanted with, covenanteth with none, save it be them, and here's the stipulation, save it be with them that repent and believe in his Son, which is the Holy One of Israel. So is that it? We just repent? And now we're good? Repent and come unto Christ. The coming unto Christ is the other part. That's, that's tied into its covenant language. It's tied into a relationship. And that's where the Book of Mormon really stands out is this phrase, come unto Christ. Because it is the next step. And I'll read one more scripture um, out of 2 Nephi. This is out of the next chapter in 13. But this tells us what's next. So you've repented of your sins. You've gotten baptized. You know, you're, you're in the way. You've repented. But now what? What do we do now? And this is what Nephi tells, For the gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism by water. Then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. Now remember we talked about last time about the ark it has one door. You know, there's only one way in and out. It's through Christ. He's the one way in for salvation. Um, and so the gate that you enter is through repentance and baptism by water. Then cometh remission. And it says, and then ye are in this straight, and notice you'll notice the spelling there. It's not S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, it's S-T-R-A-I-T, which means narrow, like the Straits of Gibraltar. It's a narrow passageway. It's controlled and narrow. It's not necessarily just like a straight line. It says, you're in this straight and narrow path, which leads to eternal life. Yea, ye have entered in by the gate. Ye have done according to the commandments of the Father and the Son. And ye have received the Holy Ghost, which witnesses of the Father and the Son unto the fulfilling of the promise which he hath made, that if ye entered in by the way, ye should receive. And now, my beloved brethren, after ye have gotten to this straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done. Behold, I say unto you, Nay. So it's not all done. Here's what must come next. For ye have not come thus far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ, and endure 
to the end. Behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. And I would, I would add that, that enduring unto the end and feasting upon the words of Christ, it's not just study and, and, and stand by. That's not what it's, it's not saying, study the scriptures and then just wait, sit on your hands and wait. It's, this is about a relationship. This is about prayer, fasting, reaching out, going outside of your normal, outside the, think outside the box, you know. The other day uh, we went down to, uh, at my work, we went down to the um, Tarrant County Food Bank, you know, and, and got, you know, helped arrange food for the, the needy. You know, and that just that felt really good. I mean, doing something else besides just my normal routine, doing something to help others. And I'm not saying that's the only way to do it, but there's, there's lots and lots and lots of ways that we can show love to other people. And it's not that we're doing it as works like, like a pat on the back or check and mark a box. It's, it's about God has blessed me, and now I want to bless you. You know, it's about, it's like that, the, 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 um, the servant that, um, that borrowed money from the, from the king, you know, and, and, you know, wanted, you know, he ended up going and charging someone else a little tiny amount. I mean, we've been given so much that we, we've got to share with others. And I'm not talking about just financially. I'm, I'm talking about our time, our, our concern, our love, our prayers, you know, reaching outside of ourselves and becoming the people of Christ. And not just members of a church, but the followers of Jesus. And so it says, um, And now behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way. And there is none other way, nor name, given under heaven, whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ. And the only true, only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and, the, and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. Amen. And so we must learn. We must spend time in prayer like Enos, who knelt down and prayed for 24 hours straight before he got an answer to the Lord in supplication. You know, we, we use that word prayer and supplication. Supplication means to beg. It means to be on your knees begging God. And, and, that, and I think realizing that we are lost without him. And so if you don't feel like he's with you every day, if you don't feel the promptings of his spirit, if you're not listening to his words, then I would encourage you to, to get, go back into your room alone, kneel down and beg him to appear in your life, to give you, help you be more aware of him. I, I believe he's speaking to us all the time. I believe the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is constantly speaking to us. But we just don't listen because we've got too many other things. When we get sick, our first thought isn't go to the Lord and pray about it. Our first thought is, oh, I wonder if the doctor's office is open still, you know? I mean, we, we want to take care of ourselves. We, we tend to just rely on the flesh. We trust the arm of flesh. And that includes your own arm, you know? We need to learn how to go to God and how to be more of a prayerful people. Um, I appreciate this congregation in that we have that prayer list that we keep going and we, you know, we all get a text all together and, you know, that's the, I haven't done that, but I haven't experienced that before. And that's, that's, we all are aware of what's going on in each other's lives, and I think that's good. But I think, you know, I think we, need to, we need to take it to the next level. We need to sort of like get a reset. You know, we have all these things in our lives that we have, we have um, defined, and there are things that are, that are not defined correctly according to the Scriptures. Um, like there are certain words like love. You know, our world doesn't even know what love is. You know, we think love is an emotion, and, and it's not. It's not an emotion. It is a, it is a genuine se- willingness to sacrifice for somebody else, to give up what I'm doing today to help you in what you're doing, just purely because I know God loves you and I love you too. You know, it's, it's not a, an emotion that, that, you know, makes us cry in a movie and then we move on. You know, it's, it's, it's got meat to it. And, uh, and our are just like God, just like we need to supplicate to God, He's actually supplicating to us. And what I mean by that is He is begging us to repent. We're a beautiful creation. Think about if your child, your, you know, you got a five-year-old little girl that gets kidnapped and she's been taken, you know, and you don't know where she is. Think about the conversation that you would have 
with those kidnappers. You know, please give her back to me. Give her back, what, what is it, whatever you want, whatever you want, I'll give it to you if I, if I can. Please give me back my little girl. Please don't do anything to her. That's the kind of passion that God has for each of us. He's saying, please let go of the world. Please don't do what you're doing. Please come unto me. Please have a relationship with me. Don't think that just studying your scriptures is enough. I want to have a relationship in your life. And he's supplicating for each of us for that. And so the question is, will we respond? Will we think that we, will we act as if we have power on our own? Or will we realize that we have no power if we don't repent and come unto him?